Welcome back to my channel and another true crime video. For this video I am taking a break from covering murder cases, and have decided to do one about a drug smuggling gang in Wales. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel as I upload true crime content twice per week. Also, please leave a comment to let me know if you liked this video, and if you would like me to make more on other crime topics, or if you would prefer me to stick to murders. Now on to the case. Cardigan Bay in West Wales is a picturesque landscape, and is renowned for its natural beauty, but in June 1983 it wasn't tourists that came to walk its beach and coastal paths, it was smugglers, who were preparing to smuggle over three tons of cannabis per week into the UK. Much of rural West Wales is made up of small communities, where people look out for each other, and everyone notices when strangers appear in the area. A local fisherman was the first to raise suspicions after seeing a stranger sitting on a remote and almost inaccessible shingle beach north of Newport known as Sel Howell. The fisherman spoke to the man who said that he was on a secret expedition, preparing to go to the Antarctic. The fisherman thought that this explanation was quite suspicious, and when he returned to land, he contacted Doved Poest police. At 8 a.m. the next morning, two police officers together with the Newport lifeboat crew, were sent to the bay to investigate. They found several items dumped on the beach including gallons of petrol, batteries, food and sleeping bags, but there was no sign of the man. A number of local farmers had also become suspicious about what was going on in the bay, after they had seen a number of strangers walking across their land late at night, and one morning around 4.30 a.m., a farmer went to start milking her cows, when she spotted a strange light in the field. The farmers had heard that the police were searching the bay, and they decided to give them a hand. A farmer picked up a stone and threw it across the beach, and heard a strange echo when it landed. He went over to take a look, and after clearing pebbles from the area in which it fell, he discovered a hatch. Police opened it to find a cave and they went in to investigate. Although it was empty, they noticed that the entire cave had been reinforced with wooden frames, and every inch of it was covered in fiberglass to make it watertight. Whatever this cave was being used for, it was obviously something valuable that needed to be protected, and they thought that the cave was being used for storing and smuggling drugs. Detectives began to stake out the area in the hope of finding out exactly what was going on in that cave, and one day a suspicious-looking man was spotted walking through fields, who then stopped and led down in the long grass on the clifftop above the cove. He was wearing a long black coat, and he had a large black rucksack on his back. The police went to ask him what he was doing and he said that he was looking for the coastal path, and had just stopped for a break. They asked him where he was from, and the address he gave them was Clarendon House, Clarendon Road in London, and said that he was a property developer. He told police that his name was Robin Boswell and police decided to arrest him. Not long after, another strange-looking man was spotted driving a Range Rover very erratically around the town of Newport. He was pulled over by police for dangerous driving, and he was arrested and taken into custody to be questioned. He told them his name was Kenneth Dewar, and he gave the address Clarendon House, Clarendon Road, in London. Police thought this was suspicious because it was the same address that the first man they arrested gave them. Police noticed something suspicious about his clothing and boots, they were covered in fiberglass particles. A few days later on the Pendinas Peninsula a third man was spotted by police and arrested. His name was Soren Berg Arnbach. He was known to police and when they checked his police record, they found that he had changed his appearance, and also his name to flee from police in Denmark where he was wanted for drug smuggling. When they searched his bag, they found a large marine radio, that is used for boats to communicate with each other. The police took the radio to the remote bay late one night and waited to see if anything happened. Shortly after midnight the radio came to life. A man's voice said, this is mother this is mother, and then said, I want to come in and get the dirt off my hands. This was obviously some sort of code, and since the police didn't know what the code was, they weren't able to reply. This was going to be the first drop-off of the drugs. They now firmly believed that it was a drug trafficking gang, but whoever was in the boat, was far out at sea and the police had no way of reaching him. Whoever it was on the other end of the radio, would now know that something wasn't right and they would be able to flee without being captured. Police desperately needed to find more evidence to keep the three men in custody. 
they found the first man they arrested, Robin Boswell, had been using several different names, and they went to London to search all of the properties that he owned. In two of the houses, one in Dockhead and the other in Kilnhanger, they found two metal tanks buried in the basements, and although they were empty they found traces of cannabis. Police continued their inquiries in Wales and locals told him they had seen the three men drinking in a local pub on several occasions, and that there was a fourth man with them. They also said the men always spent large amounts of money using high-denomination banknotes. They knew the fourth man is named Dave Frischer and told people that he was from Antibes in the south of France. In February the police went to Antibes to try to find him. Whilst looking around the port they noticed a yacht brokerage with a sign saying Jenkins over the door. Police found it interesting to find the name Jenkins, which is a popular surname in Wales, in a French port town. The door was open, so they went in and started speaking in Welsh, and a man responded in a North Walian accent. They told him they were trying to find someone and showed him a photograph, and the man said that he knew who the person was. He said that they would probably find him in Harry's bar in Antibes, and also mentioned that he was from South Africa. They went straight to the bar but they were too late, and they found out that the man had already left France. Detectives returned to Pembrokeshire empty-handed. A few days later the officer in charge of the case received a phone call from Cardigan Police asking him to contact a man in France urgently. When he called him he told the officer that Dave had returned and that he was in the bar. The officer contacted the French police and asked them to arrest him and he was extradited back to Wales. Police discovered that all three of the men were planning to smuggle drugs into Wales, and they were all charged. They denied having any involvement, but in July 1984 they went on trial at Swansea Crown Court. Robin Boswell gave evidence in court, and he claimed to have a reasonable explanation for all of it. He told him that a German U-boat had sunk near to Pendinas in World War II, and that the boat was full of gold. He said that he had built the tunnel and made it waterproof in order to store the gold that he was going to find, and claimed that a man by the name of David Klein could back up his story. The man was actually David Frischer, and at this point he didn't know that the police had already found him, and that he was now back in the UK and was charged with drug smuggling. This confirmed to the jury that all of the men were linked and were all involved in the drug smuggling operation. Robin Boswell was considered the ringleader and he was sentenced to 10 years. Soren Berg Arnbach and Kenneth Dewar received 8 years. In court the judge praised the people of Newport for their efforts in assisting the police in their capture of the gang and preventing the UK from being flooded with illegal drugs. Although this would never be the last drug smuggling operation, it would have been a substantially large one if they hadn't been caught. Police resources back in 1983 were limited compared with the technology we have these days, but they had done an incredible job. What do you think about this case? If you would like to join in the discussion, please leave your comments down below, but remember to keep it respectful for the victim's family. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you like true crime stories please subscribe to my channel, as I upload new content twice per week. Also, don't forget to turn on the notification bell to be notified when I upload. Before you go, why not check out some of my other true crime videos. I have also created several playlists, which make videos easier for you to find, by the subjects that you are interested in. If you have any suggestions for future videos, please let me know.